Now, you have been involved with politics for how long now? It's been uh, around five years. Five years, yeah. okay. So you came in during the Obama administration. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, a lot of our members don't really know you yet. Why don't you start off by introducing your life in politics? Absolutely. So um, I had a, a kind of very interesting coming into politics story, and it really started off when I came into college and as a resident of Plymouth, Massachusetts, um, I felt like there was a lot to be done um, to figure out more about my Latino identity. Um, so I came into Northeastern and really looked for opportunities for me to get involved, and I became president of the Latin American Student Organization, where I was able to start pushing the conversation about politics um, and about general community organizing. and. I was feeling very overwhelmed and very disappointed by the lack of engagement. And I think one of those things really comes in um, because there's a lack of knowledge that we're building in communities of color. Um, and being a queer Latino, um, it's very important. I realized that it was very important to push these conversations. After that, I continued. I, I ended up working in politics in Brazil. I, I, I moved to Brazil for 10 months. And then when I came back, I was more involved in, I was offered a position as the Latinx caucus for college that my husband was choosing, which was great. And um, again, I felt very disappointed. And I there, I was feeling disappointed and discouraged because there was a lack of diversity and there was also a lack of um, really co true community engagement. Um, okay. All of my work really before that had been community organizations and how to build power as an activist and how to build power as a community. Um, and I I decided to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I decided to build my own nonprofit called the Latinx Action Group. Oh cool. Um, and what we do and our aim that we still we still go through, our aim is to build bridges of knowledge for college Latinos and people of color. Um, and our strategy here is really working with uh, young folks who are usually cultural student groups, so okay, we work directly correct. with cultural student groups and uh, universities, and we bring workshops to them and to connect them to the community, connect them to... So real hardcore uh, outreach. Yes, and it's been an amazing, amazing experience. We've been able to um, reach at least five colleges, BC, Northeastern, BU, uh, Mount Holyoke, and a bunch of other colleges as well. Um, and what we do is that we, we choose strategic partners in the community okay, because okay. what we believe in is that um, to get people of color, to get young people involved in politics, mm -hmm. you have to meet them where they are. Okay, um, okay. And that means bringing organizations and bringing the issues they care about them to, to them um, in a space that, that is comfortable to them. And we found that to be extremely successful and it's been an amazing, amazing experience. We've built a coalition of more than 200 students where people have continuously come. We've done more than 15 workshops okay. since April 2015. And for example, one workshop that we did was really focused on health and healthcare, and we brought in um, the leaders of that. So uh, Find a Way Health, Healthcare for All, uh, all of these huge leaders that are right, right. fighting on the legislative side. Um, and what the point of the workshops is, is to build the power and the institutional knowledge for people. Because what I noticed is that a lot of young people and people of color um, don't have the institutional knowledge to lobby, they don't have the institutional knowledge to how to build power okay. and um, coalition and, and activism and things like that. So we're building the, we're bringing the experts to them. We work directly with community organizations to excite people. And we've seen a lot of people, you know, now uh, now that I'm president of College of North right, Massachusetts, right. Um, we, we sent more than 300 people to New Hampshire. We really organized um, this semester, we knocked on nearly 5,000 doors and, um, and registered nearly 3,000 voters. But what we saw was extremely successful is that those workshops set us up for success for that. Okay. Because we got all of their contact information. And because we had built that trust relationship and we built the relationship that we care about what you're, you're talking about, we care about what you're We're paying attention. about. Um, because that relationship was built, uh, I was able to call people up who are Latino, people of color, the Caribbean student organizations, and I was like, hey, I'm really looking um, for three to four people to volunteer this weekend in New Hampshire. We have like a, a goal of 20 or 30, and this is what we want to do, and they were able to do it. So that's the kind of model that we're bringing, uh, I'm bringing as college Democrats president. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I saw a model that really focuses on training and workshops and making sure that we're first contact, those first contact with, with individuals 
those who are not part of the process at all. Mm -hmm. we're, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of people who um, are, most cultural organizations are bipartisan. They're not right. political, they're apolitical. Right. Um, and we're bringing them in because we're bring, meeting them and we're like, this is not a Democrat meeting, this is a meeting about healthcare. Okay. And it's really being focused on the issues, which resonates with, with Democrats because we're the party of, that really cares about the issues. So you started your career in clinic, the Cranberry Corner. Yeah. Uh, then you uh, went to college, got active in college, went back to Brazil, did some working over there, came back. Um, set up the nonprofit, I assume, right? Yes. Uh, and now you're a college uh, Democrat. Uh, and it sounds like you got a good model. You have a lot of success. Uh, sent a lot of bodies to New Hampshire, knocked a lot of doors. Um, tell me something. So, a lot of the people who are voting, um, as you know, we've got a lot of stuff going on in Washington, making a lot of people nervous. Um, and the DNC didn't perform as well as we wanted them to. Um, if somebody comes up to you, what's your elevator pitch? The three minutes for why they should vote for you and send you to the DNC. Absolutely. So I think that because we have a body of, of experienced members, and uh, a lot of them have been older, uh, are older, and especially the delegation we sent to the DNC, uh, bringing someone with passion and perspective and someone with a perspective as someone who's been undocumented, Mm -hmm. um, who is Latino, who's also queer, um, that brings a whole different picture to it. And because I'm not coming to this with that, you know, basically me just being like, oh, I want to do this for my own like political gain, like, I, I want to do this because I see that for all of my identities, if I'm not in the conversation, a lot of things are going to go wrong. Okay. Um, and that is the sort of kind of perspective we need. We need someone who is going to be willing to you know, stand up and be like, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. And we bring in the experienced voices. You know, there's eight people who go from Massachusetts right. to the DNC. You know, seven out of the eight of those are experienced, have amazing, you know, campaign experience. But bringing someone who's embedded in the community, who is deeply interested in, in continuing and really rebuilding the party, and who's passionate and have sh has shown that passion in the last five years, I think that's, that says a lot, and we have to be opening up leadership spots for, for individuals. And I, you know, I, I try to do that for, for everything, and we try to make sure that we're building new leaders and we're allowing them to actually build themselves, come up to the top. Uh, come up to the top. And uh, one of the things that um, our chair, new chair, is saying is that we're building leaders, um, and it's important we build those leaders through, you know, if you think about like one of the best democracies, couple of the best Democrats in the state representatives, a lot of these leaders started early. They started 19, 20 years old. They ran right. for office. We have to continue and we have to allow that to Grow happen. the bench. We have to grow the bench and we have to allow things to flourish. And I'm not saying I want all young people. I want one seat or two seats that are young and then the rest experience. And right. that's how you actually build a party. That's how you build a new kind of future for the party. We have a new chair, like you mentioned, Gus Bickfit, um, and uh, he's vacating the seat. So you are not getting a full term. You're going to get three years. Um, so what I was thinking is, can you tell me um, what you think the three things in the upcoming cycle, we've got to take the Congress in 2018 and the White House in 2020. What does the DNC need to focus? Three things. Absolutely. So the first one has to be transparency and looking at how we are going to build an organization that is managing what it's doing in a way that's transparent and also very organized. I think that's something that we miss and I think that even if Democrats don't like to admit it as much, I think the general public feels like the DNC is very corrupt. Okay, so um, we're saying structure, transparency, organization, number one thing on the number list. Number one thing on the list. Uh, number second on the list is community outreach and okay. learning to listen to the Latino, the people of color, the labor unions, 
and understand why they left us. Okay. Um, and why so you're talking below the leadership right to the actual person in that case. So I think that the mo one of the most important things is like figuring out how to build coalitions. As part of that community outreach, which is my second thing, um, how do you reach out to the community in a way that you're building trust for them to come back and be like, all right, you know, we don't, we're not asking these people to be Democrats. Like, you know, we're very, de you know, we're always hardcore. Democrats, hardcore. Yeah. We're not normal. But the reality of it is, is most people aren't. Right. And we have to build that trust and be like, meet them where they are and understand that, you know, they're going to be there for us when it comes to election, but we have to put that effort in when it's not election time. So it's grass, so second thing is yeah. grassroots, where people are on the level they are. Yeah. Not going to the leadership, going to actually, the third thing, what do you think? And then building coalitions. So coalitions. making sure that um, the coalitions we're building and the way that we're creating the messages that we you know, that the DNC creates um, is about leading that intersectional fight. How do we bring together, you know, the Latino struggle, the black struggle, the LGBTQ struggle, and the labor struggle, and how do we create a message that, you know, is straight to the point because it's about the issues and it unites everyone, but also pays individual attention and doesn't use identity politics as tokenism. So we're talking about coalition building with message structures. Yes. So refining our message, making sure we've got it right, and but at the same time building those coalitions. Yeah. So pretty aggressive things that you want to do yes. there. You've got three years. Mm -hmm. At the end of three years, let's assume you win, um, what do you want to have accomplished? One thing. One thing. Um, I definitely want to see, I think my number one priority, and it speaks from my experience, mm -hmm. is see the party build those coalitions better. The coalitions. Um, the coalitions and the community aspect go hand in hand. Right, right. Um, and how do we as town committees, how do we as city committees, um, at the DNC level, how does the DNC level kind of approach the local level in a way that's helping them build those bridges and really create an intersectional struggle between all of these, these constituents and these people who live. So I think that's, that's the thing that I'm bringing to the table and that I want to see more of in the DNC and hopefully be able to approach that and do that in those three years. You got quite the ambition. I yeah. really am excited about your candidacy. How's the campaign trail doing? It's been really great. The response has been incredibly positive. Uh, we've had a lot of people who have just been very excited that there's a new candidate that um, you know the Democratic State Committee is bringing new people in. Um, I've been making calls to everybody as much as I can. Um, now, I, would, I pointed out for the other candidates, it's not just one call. Yes. You call people and you have to get yeah. a call back and then it's you're playing phone tag. Yes. So it's a lot of work. Uh, not like being uh, campaigning for the president, you're actually doing a lot of hard phone calls. Yes, it's, it's quite a... and the conversations have been enlightening and I've been telling this uh, to everyone that um, because I'm such a young kind of individual and, and fresh to the Democratic State Committee, it's been a great opportunity to get to know people, to get to know the type of personalities, to get to know their perspectives. Um, and I think that's probably the most important thing and that I'm getting out of it, whether I win or not. I think that um, getting to know these people has been mm -hmm. incredible. And there's so much, you know, to learn from, from everybody. Experience, experience and knowledge. Experience and knowledge. And um, I had a conversation with Russ, who's another candidate, yesterday. Right. And he was like... Which I'm going to be seeing Russ on Sunday, 5 o'clock, so... Uh, he was just very, like... We, we have to continue working together, and there's been a lot He's of... He's a great guy, exciting, so yeah. So it's, it's, been, it's been really welcoming in that aspect. Um, you know, most people have been very fresh and very excited that I'm running, even if they're not voting. So people see this, they talk to you on the phone. Um, how do they get involved? So What's, where do where do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so there's definitely my Facebook. Uh, my Facebook has... I have... If you look up Santiago Nariño, make sure to include the Enya in my last name. Yeah, so you have to be careful um, because there's se several people with your name and you have to make sure you yes. get the last name spelled right. Uh, I have a political page that I, I run all kind of the smaller campaigns or all the campaigns that I've, I've okay, done. Okay, what page is that? Um, right on Facebook, so it's right. Santiago Nariño, you can look me up. Okay. Um, that, you can also add me on my personal one, um, and then I've been sending a lot of engaging emails, and a lot of trying to connect one-on-one, -on -one, which has been working quite uh, well. Um, we've been able to get on the phone with at least 60 people we, like really have conversations with, and it's because I've been, um, you know, those emails have been really engaging people. 
so that, that's really the, the best way. Um, or they can call me. I'm more than available. I, I make more than enough time for, for people. So I'm going to put all of this on the page. Um, so I'll put your phone number up there, your email. You have Twitter? Yes, I have Twitter. Um, and that is, um, I just changed it. To this, so so he'll, he'll yeah. give that to me and I'll put it up there. Uh, this is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah, thank you really so um, we have another set of interviews coming up this weekend, 5 o'clock on Saturday. I've got Ed and 5 o'clock on Sunday I've got Russ. Um, I think we have a great candidate here. I hope you guys consider voting for him. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah.